Okay, it's 1032, guys. Even for realtors, we're going to get started. Um, so tell me, you guys, we are having a good month. You guys are out there when you're not complaining to me that there's nothing to buy and you can't win. You're out there selling a lot of stuff. So tell me what's going on. We have and about, looks like 60% of you are on the buyer side. Mm. And about 50% of you on the seller side. And that only makes sense because some of you have both. So tell me what you're doing out there to be successful winning these multiple offer situations. Give me some good stories. You guys are winning them. Tell me how. This will be a, we can go back and forth. Dalton, you've got at least three deals closed already this month. What, what do you got going on? Uh, I think a good portion of those were listings, but um, to be totally honest with you, uh, my buyers are good buyers. I, I had somebody call yesterday that the first time home buyer needs down payment assistance. I said, hey, uh, go ahead and sign a, a lease for a year and save money because there's no way I'm going to be able to get you under contract. I don't believe so. Um, most people I'm working with are cash or 20% people closing today for me or 30% down. So it's easier to win offers whenever you're not FHA and VA. So that'll be your fifth deal this month. I see four now fifth deal in March. Um, who else has got something going on? Who else has got a, successful buyers? I'm saying here, I just got good buyers. I've got one under contract in Mineola of all places. I'm downtown Daryl. Hello. But um, I look up and I see the citrus tower. I'm like, what am I doing clear out here? But got a house under contract. My buyers are strong. Um, they virtually had to agree with everything that the seller wanted including the purchase price, which was too high, in my opinion. Um, we had an appraisal done. It was too high. The appraisal came in 20,000 lower, which is pretty much what I said it was going to be. Um, they miraculously found $9,500 from their father. And let's see, what else? Oh, we asked for repairs we didn't get. Yeah, pretty much it's a seller's market. <laughs> no matter what, what we ask for, we didn't get. Um, but they know that they have to buy something and it's time to move. So push comes to shove and they did what they had to do. Nice, nice. Um, little known fact, one of your favorite people in the world uh, was actually, actually grew up in Mineola. This guy right here. Very cool. Uh, yeah. Um, it was cool. It was on the Lake Lake Mineola. Back in those times, it was cheap out there, of course, and it's getting more and more expensive. Um, Tammy, four buyers already this month you've closed. What's going on? Four buyers this month? You've had four buyers on my sheet. Uh, that you, closed? Yeah. Yeah, I did. I did close four deals. Well. But my plate, my plate is clear. No, I, I have a few. <laughs> well, tell me, tell me what was successful for you. Um, going over the appraised value, offering to go over appraised value, um, you know, having buy, well, one of my buyers, she had like a lot of money down. So that's always good, you know, um, cause you have people that have money. Th th those are the good ones to have as buyers because you have a lot of more options. Um, um, one, I had to throw in $1,000 to help him with closing costs to get the deal done. But hey, I'd rather have some money than no money. Um, but last night, I got an email from a previous buyer, which those are always so fun to get. And he emails me, hey, we're going to keep our townhouse and rent it out. But we're going to, we want, what do you think about this house, which was priced at $4.99 in Lake Nona? He goes, well, what do you think about $4.75? Do you think that would be a good offer? And I called him. He's like, oh, you're so fast. And I said, I don't know if you're familiar with our market right now, but those, they, it's been on the market zero days. They're not going to take 25 less. And so 
anyway, he goes, well, we'll watch it. I'm thinking, okay, we'll watch it. You can watch and see what happens because it's going to go under contract shortly. Um, but anyway, uh, they'll, they'll buy something here. They're just kind of starting that journey. They sold something in Puerto Rico. So I have a guy from Titusville that called me another one that I sold to a while ago. And um, it was a really hard deal and I got it done and he called me and he wants to sell. So I got, I'll do that. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Good. So uh, it sounds like you guys are having really strong buyers or be the ones that are being successful, of course. Um, yeah, I, I run into very few people. I don't, I don't know about what you guys experience. I run into very few people who don't know that it's a big seller's market right now. A lot of people, even if they're not looking to buy or sell, they're just friends or whatever. And they'll mention to me, man, I heard about this market out here. It's crazy. You know, is this a bubble like before? And they'll ask you all kinds of stuff. So a lot of our job is educating the clients. Um, so uh, we have talked before about the things and, and you guys have mentioned uh, waiving the appraised value. Um, and you guys, uh, we talked a little bit of this on our, our FRI agents Facebook page. Um, be careful when you're doing that. Be careful when you're writing that language. Um, be sure that you limit it to the purchase price because we've had those. I, I saw one where they were willing to go uh, 10,000 over appraised value. Um, and that's all they put. Buyer yeah, agrees to, go to pay up to 10,000 over appraised value. And well, what if appraised value is only 1,000 below purchase price? So now they're paying 9,000 more than they thought technically, right? So be sure when you, and this is just an agent out there writing these things. Uh, fortunately, somebody else's agent writing these things. And so just be very careful when you do this. You're not attorneys. Be just, we have some stuff that, that is attorney approved and you can write that, but make sure that you limit it to the purchase price, right? We'll pay up to purchase price, up to $10,000, but no more than purchase price, right? Con put contracted purchase price, okay? And that includes any escalation, includes any of that kind of stuff because that is your actual contracted uh, purchase price. So, because a lot of guys are mixing, um, are mixing, um, escalator clauses with with um, with uh, wave of, of appraisal and that kind of stuff. So let's talk about once escalation. You, once your office sure. offer gets accepted because you had some of that wording in there, I think you would still, before you actually sign, you would still work out those details and narrow it down and make sure everybody's on the same page with what you're saying. Well, yeah, you're going to have a contracted yeah. purchase price where you'll yeah. rewrite, you'll rewrite right. in there and initial, right. everybody will initial and all that kind of stuff. Right, right, right. I'm just, I'm just telling you to, to be careful when you're doing that and take all that stuff into consideration. Yeah. So let's talk about a couple of other things. Um, one, I want to talk about escalation clauses. Guys, if you're only raising it, if you've got an FHA offering, you're only raising it a thousand dollars, you're not going to win. Okay. They can, they can decline your escalation. They can take a lower offer. You're only a thousand dollars or five hundred dollars more on a on a five hundred thousand dollar house. They're not interested in that. If you're going to do that, either a just offer more money. If you know there's a, multiple offers and you know it's going to go over asking, just offer more money originally and put on there. Do by fives and tens. If it's if it's a if it's a you know four or five hundred thousand dollar house, do fives and tens. If we're talking about a, a I mean if it's one fifty, you're not going to do fives and tens. You'll do you know thousands. Okay. Um, I can't really see a, a need for a $500 one. Now you're not going to beat somebody's offer who has a better offer of overall, a stronger buyer by going $500 over or even a thousand, unless it's a really cheap place. Okay. Second of all, and, and, and frankly, what good are escalation clauses without appraisal waivers at this point, if we're going above asking when you guys are listing stuff, you're going ahead and listing it a little over your comps. Now, anyway, there used to be the strategy of listing it right at my comps or a little below my comps and seeing get multiple offers. Now you can list it above your comps and get multiple offers, right? So um, people are, the reason your strong buyers are winning is because cash is king and you've got to go over nowadays. Um, and again, burn this tape a year from now because we're not going to be doing this anymore or whenever that is. But uh, um, eventually that's what we're going to do. So I want to talk to you about something else that I've just seen in the last two weeks and that is uh, waiving um, inspections. People are waiving inspections. Um, how does that sound to you guys? Mm, I don't know. Crazy, right? Horrible. And people are doing uh, anything. I love them. it as a I love it as a listing agent. 
and the sellers love it. And that's why uh, <laughs> actually one of one of you guys, not on this call right now, one of you guys uh, called me upset that they lost a deal because, and the, and the listing agent was kind enough to tell them, yeah, they waived their inspection. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, one school of thought on that is, and my response was, well, you're not going to argue for anything anyway. You might as well, you're not going to win. Like Daryl just said, he wanted, he wanted repairs. Tough luck. Take a hike. Well, we've got eight other offers sitting here behind you. And if I put it back on the market on Thursday, I'll be back under contract Saturday night. Right. In this market. So it's a, it's a, uh, it's yeah, I don't recommend it. Um, depending on the age of the house or whatever you, you see when you walk through or something. I, I don't know. Getting that sale under those conditions, I don't know if it's worth the commission. You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, yeah. There's but some but money be, is not worth it. Just be prepared that you're going to run into that. Now, I've also seen three-day inspection periods and four-day inspection periods and stuff like that. That's, that's Dalton's doing that. Because, guys... It, Dalton's doing that. Are you using uh, 10 point and getting him in there the first day? Uh, well, I've got a couple of guys I use, but even if they're septic and well, I'm doing three to four days because I'm calling them before I go into contract and saying, hey, I might need this done. Yep. Guys, we've talked about this before, building your team, getting relationships. You need lenders. You need inspectors. You need to be friends with these people. You need to send them. Use the same <laughs> one so you're sending them business. If you're sending them one deal every three years, they're not going to jump through hoops for you. But if you're sending them lots of deals, or even if it's just all your deals, say, look, I only do 12 deals a year, but I'll give them all to you if, you're, if you'll jump, you know, in so many words, if you'll jump when I, when I ask. And so you're going to need to have good, good relationships with your vendors to get them to, to move on stuff. Okay. But that's the kind of thing. There's no, there's no reason you can't have that inspection back. Um, there's, you know, and if you need a, a two day extension because you found five things wrong and you need some estimates or something like that, it's a lot easier to ask for two days on the third day than to ask for 10 days up front. What about surveys, guys? Um, I'm seeing 45 days for surveys. And I'm doing commercial, I'm not doing residential stuff, but I'm seeing a minimum of 45 days uh, for, for surveys. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's bad. It's bad. Everybody's backed up. Everybody's backed up. Um, lenders are backed up. Underwriters are backed up. Deals are falling apart and begging for extensions and stuff like that. You're always better off begging for an extension um, when you're, uh, you're already so far down the road. So if, if Daryl has a listing and I'm asking him for another week, as opposed to him having, even in the seller's market, him having to start all over again, He's better off just with another week. Um, but Bob, I don't have an answer for that, Bob. I, I don't, I, I, I've seen it too. People are waiting on surveys. People are waiting on that stuff. People are, uh, title companies dropping the ball on ordering them. People not knowing who should order them, all that stuff. Get on top of your surveys. Get on top of all this stuff right away. Do, do we have any any good lists? I mean, I kind of know the, the local people here somewhat. I mean, Blackburn and, and whatnot, but Glassy's going out of business. Um, He's retiring. Um, I tried getting hold of Jeff Roden. He's not taking business. And again, um, you know, I, I do commercials, so I'm one of those people that does, you know, a dozen, fifteen deals a year uh, or whatever. But um, any other recommendations on survey people? So Bob's out in my neck of the woods, and uh, yeah, Blackburn is uh, it, it's run by good friends of mine, but they yep. are very slow. Yep. Very slow. And I've used all, I've used Jeff and I've used Galassi, but um, yeah, that's getting slim pickings out there. Um, e even the ones in you know, the winter garden area and all that kind of stuff. I know what you're looking for, but it's, it's hard to get them. It's hard to get them going. It is. They're, they're crazy slow. Well, I, I mean, I'm sure they're busy. They're not just sitting around, but I, I, I don't have an answer for that. You got to keep okay. finding, keep looking. That's and fine. Finding. Um, but yeah, surveys are another thing to consider guys. Um, and everybody is backed up. Lots of underwriting is backed up. I hear you guys complain about it all the time. Lots of refis going on, even still, um, rates are creeping back up, but still people who've waited this long, they're still getting a better deal. So, um, anything else you guys are doing to help win deals or anything you're doing that's losing deals that you think? The lender and closing time has made a big difference with a lot of mine, um, 
Chase is guaranteeing a 21 day close and giving a money, you know, giving money to a buyer if they don't do it in time. Um, but that's what we recently got me one because the other lenders that are at 30 days, it's almost impossible to compete with cash. So Angie, you were successful with that? Yeah, with Chase, 21 day closes. Yeah. Did it get closed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I have another one under contract now, but yeah, I've done at least two that have closed in 21 days. And this other one seems on track to close the appraisal has already um, been ordered and everything seems on track as far as the lender goes i don't know if survey will be on time but as far as the buyer side with the lender it's good okay and um we uh we actually have a, a guest coming on here if he's not on yet and um he's gonna he's a uh, lender you guys know tom tom is going to talk about some things that they're doing to help you guys get deals closed as well um He'll be on here in the next few minutes, but yes, create these partnerships with your lenders. I saw that. It's funny. Uh, the reason I asked Angie is I saw that advertisement and I think it was only a thousand bucks or something. Uh, maybe it wasn't Chase. It maybe it was somebody else. I saw that uh, guarantee, but it was only like a thousand bucks. And I was thinking I, that's not going to help much if they don't close, but it is nice that they are yeah. successfully closing that quickly. That's great. Yeah. They're successfully doing them. And you know, every lender that I talked to, like the direct actual loan officers at Chase, um, they said, yeah, they can absolutely get it done. So, and there's another lender. I don't remember who it was that Doreen is working with. Um, and they said they can close in 23 days. So we put 23 days on a contract now. Um, so just every single day counts right now. <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Every single day counts. You guys, you're, you're sitting there and they're just, and everybody has their, every seller has their hot button issue. As you guys know, when you work with sellers, everybody's got their hot button issue. Um, some of them don't like this. Some of them don't like that. Some of them don't like FHA or they don't like uh, VA, they don't like whatever because they've been burnt by it before. They don't like long inspection periods. They don't like this. They don't like that. Everybody's got something. Just do the best you can all across the board. And don't be afraid to ask the listing agent, what's going to help this deal sell? Right? Because if someone asks you as a listing agent, you'd help them, right? Because you want to do what's best for your client. Say, give me a short inspection period. Give me this. Give me that. Give me more money down. Give me whatever makes them feel comfortable. Give me a bigger escrow. Right? It's refundable. As long as you don't, as long as you don't violate your contingencies, it's refundable. Yeah. One more thing, Ryan, I was um, just thinking that now too, because I have a listing that's hitting the market on Friday and I'm putting all that stuff in the realtor remarks of what the seller is looking for to hopefully limit the offers coming into where I don't have 45 instead I have 10 really good ones. So all the information you just said, I'm putting that in the realtor remarks. Seller would prefer this, 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 and this. Okay. Fantastic. Those are the number one questions too. That's exactly what I look at as a listing agent. I, I, on my listings, I put exactly what my seller's looking for usually in the realtor remarks. And I say, hey, you know, and I have other buyer agents call me and, and, and they ask, how can we get this? Okay, this is how you can get this. And Ryan just said, I want to see as small as inspection period as possible. So I, as a buyer's agent, when I'm a buyer's agent, I make sure that my inspectors can go out there within three days, just like Dalton. Um, and it's just simple things like that, but you got to call and you got to ask. I had what 11 offers yesterday on the little condo that I listed over full sale for 105 that I put on the website, 11 offers that I had to go through. Um, and that's exactly how somebody wanted it. They went above listing price. They had no appraisal. They had zero inspection period. And that's exactly what, what sellers are looking for. Yeah. <laughs> Every seller. That's what I want. Yes, absolutely. Um, you want yes. them to buy the property blind. <laughs> so the there blind hold on and sign here. <laughs> right. Yeah. You don't even need to see it. Yeah. Blank um, contract. Jeremy, Let the seller fill in the price. Exactly. Yeah. Just yeah, send a blank contract <laughs> with a blank check. Um, <laughs> Joanne, can you speak now? Okay. Joanne, uh, you're unmuted now. I don't know. She says she can't unmute herself, but she wanted to share experience with a uh, with a buyer where they had two accepted offers, buyer withdraw from contract. Now we have another accepted contract finance at 95%. Um, okay, I don't, I don't understand that, Joanne, I'm sorry. Um, Dalton wishes realtors would read the remarks. Yes. Um, Jika lost a deal because my buyer didn't show too much cash in account, even though they had 50K more than what we offer was a cash deal. Um, so you didn't send a, a strong enough uh, uh, proof of funds, I guess, Jika? 
Um, yeah, you guys, oh, by the way, when you show proof of funds, don't make sure you black out your uh, account numbers and stuff like that. Uh, make sure your client does before they even send it to you. Please instruct them to do that because um, you guys submit these and and uh, we had some we had some uh, staff issues recently. And so I've been having to review some of your documents and stuff. And I'm seeing some proof of funds where with everything to, to just, just have them black it out, please, before they send it to you. You don't want that responsibility. We don't want that responsibility. Um, and you certainly don't want to give it to some some other agent and some other seller, anybody else. So. Um, make sure you're blacking those out. Yes, according to the listing agent, they accept an offer that showed more cash in the account. So, so Jika, Jika had one where he showed plenty of cash to buy, plenty of proof of funds to buy, but they liked it that somebody else had more money, even though it was more, way more than enough to cover what they were, what they were doing. That's so. Let's say, for example, um, Let's say, for example, that they they the, the place was selling for two hundred thousand. Jika sent him one for two twenty five. Somebody else sent him one for four hundred thousand. A proof of funds, not a contract. Proof of funds, and they just liked it because this other person had a lot more money, just in case. I guess I don't I don't know why, but uh, I think that's what he's telling me. Um, that's crazy. So, you know, maybe maybe those are the kinds of things you can find out from a listing agent. I don't think a listing agent would even know, but that's a silly reason to lose one. Um, Tammy's going to leave at 11. She's, she's rude. Um, we're all going to think you're rude anyway, Tammy. Um, let's see here. Um, what else, what else, uh, any other good, good things that are working or not working for you guys? Tell me why you lost one. Anybody? You guys are killing it out there. That's yeah, fantastic. prices are just <laughs> prices are just higher than what my buyers are approved for. So, you know, a few months ago when my buyer got approved at you know three hundred or even two seventy five a few months ago, that seemed like a good price for a single family home in St. Petersburg, and now they're all at three hundred and they're going for way higher. So she moved, got her approval up to three hundred. And we're still losing out because, you know, she's only offering maybe 10 or 20 grand above list price. So now she's having to look at maybe 250 houses, which there's just hardly any. And most of them are crap. So it's, it's just the combination of the low inventory and the prices going up higher than, you know, what kind of the average buyer is able to do. Do you, do you ask people okay. if they have money in a 401k? Because some people... Have retirement money that they could access that they might not be aware of either. You know? I mean, I had before this particular instance isn't that's not the case where you know she doesn't have any extra funds over this, and also she's she was at a a three percent conventional, you know, down payment, and now she raised it up to a five percent down payment because I think that's been one of her factors that have been a problem, um, where other you know other people just are able to prove that they are financing less um, and have more cash in the bank, and she just doesn't so. It's just a challenging time for this particular buyer. But and I have a hard time saying to pay three fifty for this house that we all know was worth two fifty two months ago. <laughs> it's that mindset. It's so hard to switch over and be like, oh, forget it. Yeah, waste money. You won't have equity for twenty years, but it's okay. <laughs> or maybe put, they will. What right? if she put three percent down and the extra money she was going to put down to make it the five percent, she used that cash to pay over appraised value with. That's true. That might be a good idea. Um, I'm just not sure. Like from what I've heard from other listing agents that we've put in, I don't know, maybe 10 offers recently. Um, the listing agents, you know, said that it was, you know, that it was close on a lot of factors, but she only had 3% and this other buyer had five or 10 or 20. Um, yeah, so that's yeah. been one of the factors that we've lost out. And if she will pay over mm -hmm. appraised and they're not going to, then. Yeah, um, that's a good idea. You know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's What's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. A uh, single family home, three, two, somewhere near Pinellas Park. Um, and just kind of a, you know, a decent neighborhood because her parents, her older parents are going to live there. Gotcha. Nope. I got a nice condo coming up in Safety Harbor. Yeah. I'll try to convince them, but there's a little bit, a few. All right. Um, 
Does everybody hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay, good. Um, uh, Daryl also is going to go get his shot. Uh, Daryl, I did not know that they were doing 25 years old and up yet, but that's good. Um, good luck with that. The uh, conventional 3%, she is approved for 300K, then that means FHA3 will increase the loan approval. Okay. Um, there you go. Lots of good ideas. So, um, what? Uh, so, what have we decided here? What are you guys? What are you guys going to do moving forward? What are we going to change? What are we going to try to do to get more? And you guys are doing great. But what are we going to try to do to get more? Any ideas? Meet more people. <laughs> the more people you meet, the more great buyers you'll find. Right? That's true. Guys, the, the people that are buying right now typically are your better buyers. I mean, you guys, uh, are, you guys are seeing that, right? Those are the stronger buyers, stronger buyers than you had two years ago, on average. Um, these are people who- No, Ryan, no, Ryan, we don't want new more buyers. We want more sellers. Well, well <laughs> yeah, but we're not having, this isn't about sellers. Selling is easy nowadays. Um, yeah, yeah, two years from now, we'll be doing a class on how can I get my listing out there where people will see it and please bring me buyers. How can we attract more buyers? That'll be, uh, I'll go ahead and schedule that from two years, for two years from now. Maybe all, year from now, who knows? all of my buyers are sellers. Buyers yeah. are sellers. Buyer leads or seller leads. Yep. And you know what? Uh, well, right now, that's, that's what we're finding right now. Not as many first time home buyers. A lot of them have homes. A lot of them have that kind of stuff. And what are you guys telling people now when they want to do uh, which probably are 80% of your people, 90% of your people now, uh, current homeowners looking to move up or on or areas or whatever. What are you telling them now about the timing of everything? What should, what's my first move? Daryl, I am interested in moving to another area. What's my, what should I do first? Or any, I think uh, Daryl. Yeah, no, you have to show them actually what's available in that area. And so you, you have to show them, you have to do your homework for them. Um, it's tough right now because, okay, yeah, they can sell for a really good price, but where are they moving? What can they buy for a good price? So it's a, it's a really tough situation right now with some buyers or some sellers too. Um, you got to work it through with them. It, it, it's tough on both sides because okay. I've, I've, I've got a seller that I sold, what, in one South Eola a um, couple months ago. He's now looking in Baldwin Park. He's looking at 500 or so. We can't find him anything. He's got 500,000 in the bank, cash, but we can't find anything. Cause once we find something, okay, it's listed in 495, it sells for like 560. So yeah, it, it's it's tough for, for sellers and then buyers as well. Okay, Daryl, so I've got this, these people, and I know you and Tammy have got to go, it's, a, it's 11 o'clock, but I've got these people who are, um, these are made up people, but they want to sell their house for 350 somewhere and buy one for 500 somewhere a little bit nicer. Okay. Whatever. What am I, what, what's their first step? How do I talk them through it? What do they need to do first? What do they need to do second? What, what, do, just give me the, how does this work? I don't know anything about real estate. How does this work? Anybody? Go Tammy, you go first. Tammy, Tammy just left. She's going to go take your shot. Oh no figures. Um, like I said, you, you have to educate them. You have to show them what's available out there. Um, it might not be a good time for them to sell right now. They might have to wait a little bit. Um, that's just, that's how the market is right now. If they can't find anything that they can buy. Um, so, yeah. So am, I looking to, so am I looking to buy first or am I looking to sell? Should I list my house? Should I uh, find somewhere to live first? What should I do first? I, I, don't, under, I don't understand. It's not to buy in cash or, or um, if they're going to need to uh, finance. So you need to know the, what they approve for. Right. Let's say, let's say the approvals aren't going to be any problem. So you want to get them pre-approved first. That's great. Um, but what's their first, what's their, what's their next move? What, what do I do first? I would talk, I would talk to them about the options of selling their home and finding somewhere else to live. So that they have cash to buy the next house. Um, because that's how they'll be able to get the best deal in this current market. Um, so go over any, any options if it's possible for them to get their house on the market, get it sold. So then you'll have the cash in the bank ready to buy with less contingencies so that you'll have a better chance of getting a house. If that's not an option, then we go through what the next best scenario would be 
Um, your house needs to be on the market under contract before you put in another one because a contingency is just too hard to win these days. Um, so, you know, letting them know that that's how the market currently is right now. And it is a great opportunity to sell your house for top dollar. Um, but if you want to buy, then that would be the best scenario. Would it be to sell? Okay. Depending on where they're going, uh, Ryan, I would also recommend that they uh, look at new builds because they've got the luxury of the time and uh, most builders will, will uh, take a contingency contract, but at least they'll know when they have to put their house on the market. Because if, if they're moving up or even if they're moving down or a change of lifestyle, a new build might be a, a choice that, that we run into. Okay. I've, got, I've got six of these clients right now, Ryan. And I've got one of them that's went to new build. So a couple of things, I tell all of them, they need to do one of two first. They either need to buy if they, if, there's, if they can afford two homes, if they can get approved to do that, they need to buy first. So I've got three people that, did, that have done that, you know, one just closed. So he's about to list his house because we know we're going to sell quick or they need to sell and move into a rental and then buy. Now, the one that did new construction, because we don't know what rates are going to do, we went ahead and locked, we're going to lock his rate. And we're going to go ahead and sell and he's going to rent because his home's not going to be done until December. But we don't know what the market's going to be like at the end of the year. Maybe it comes down a little bit. So they don't want to take that risk. So they're, I'm still telling them, hey, you should probably go rent. You know, because if you go rent for six months, you're going to be out at the most, maybe somewhere between eight and $12,000. Yep. But you're, you're going to save that in your rate by locking your rate today, hopefully. I like it. I like it if they have the ability to do two homes. But all right, guys, I'm going to interrupt this conversation real quickly. We have a special guest. Uh, uh, Tom is on his laptop, apparently. And we're going to talk to Tom. And uh, he is going to tell us how uh, lenders, and specifically his company as well, um, can help you, and him personally, can help you win these um, hard-to-win battles with these multiple offers. So Tom, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, open it up to questions. If you guys have any questions about lending, uh, but Tom is also going to talk about what he's doing to help people close on, on how to win these multiple offers and close on these deals. Thanks, Ryan. I thought that that was the most creative way to name my screen, Tom's laptop, you know, kind of right to the point. <clears throat> everybody, good to be with you. Um, so I think everybody should just give up. It's too hard, right? Not really. Um, it's really hard out there. We know that um, we're pre-approving all kinds of people and they're making six, seven, eight offers. I, we know what you guys are going through. I'm, I'm just sitting at my desk getting calls saying, yeah, we lost another one, we lost another one. You guys are actually out there doing all the hard work and I know that's difficult. Um, but there are some ways to stand out. A um, couple of things that we do and I've been doing um, lately is let your lender know, whoever it is, hopefully it will be me. Um, but if it's not, let your lender know who you're making an offer to. There's a small chance, depending on how long somebody's been in the business, um, uh, 17 years for me, I know a lot of the listing agents. I can pick up the phone and say, hey, Juan, how you doing, buddy? Haven't seen you in a while. Just that little thing helped me last week get a deal because he worked with me as a buyer's agent. He doesn't do that anymore. Be, make sure that lender is proactive in reaching out to say, hey, this is a really well-qualified buyer. Now, yes, are the other lenders doing that? Probably, but not all of them. So hopefully your person will stand out. If they don't have experience, that's okay. Um, you know, you can, you can, they can tout their own company's experience and, and how their own experience, but uh, that absolutely goes a long way in doing that. I have listing agents contacting me all the time now. They're, they're reaching out. The good ones are understanding. I need to find out from that lender, you know, does this one stand out more than the other one? Because, you know, they have four similar offers they have to look at. Um, I got one in Boca Raton the other day over a cash offer. Um, not sure why, just had a conversation with the guy, um, but they like the offer better. So that's, that's one thing that they can help. From the lending point standpoint and the financing standpoint, um, Normally, we have three contingencies on a contract, right? You have an appraisal contingency, an inspection contingency, and a financing contingency. So I'm going to address the appraisal contingency. It seems to be going out the window the most, right? You guys are having agents say, you know, we don't want a contingency on the appraisal. Or the one I just had a few days ago, they capped it at 10 grand below 
uh, contract price, which I thought was a pretty fair way to do it. If both sides agree that on a 350 contract price, if it comes in anywhere between 340 and 350, buyer moves forward. If it comes in lower than that, we cancel the deal or we negotiate. Um, you know, most of the time we're going to negotiate that, I'm sure. Um, so that's, I think, an interesting way to do it. The caveat that the lender needs to give you and your buyer is what that means financially for that buyer. If my buyer needs 20 grand to close and they have 22 grand in the bank, it's going to be really hard for me to get them to agree to something that's 10 grand below that they're going to have to come with 10 grand more, correct? That's going to be difficult. Now, the buyer who has the funds to do that is in a different situation. Um, they can afford, if in their mind it's worth it, to pay 350 for a house that appraises for 340, um, then that's a good way to do it. Um, the other thing that I've seen done with the inspection periods is while it may be difficult, if you can extend that long enough for order, us to order the appraisal on a rush, and a lot of this depends on the buyer. Um, you guys, I've been with you guys before and you've probably heard me say that delays in closing are primarily caused by the buyers. The buyers that get me what I need up front, the buyers that respond quickly, that log in and e-sign their disclosures quickly are gonna close on time. The buyers that take me three weeks to get a bank statement and I've bugged them six times to do it are the ones that are gonna close late. So if you can get that inspection period to be long enough where we could potentially order a rush on the appraisal, now we can get that appraisal back inside that inspection period. And if that appraisal comes in too low or it doesn't work, you can back out without that appraisal contingency. So that's a second option. The third contingency is a financing contingency, which is gonna help with the buyers who don't have the extra cash. And I'm gonna give you a scenario where buyers who are putting 10 to 20% down or more are in the best position of all. Um, and, I, and I want um, Dalton, if you'll remind me, um, when you mentioned about the buyer getting qualified without selling their home, um, I'm gonna to touch on that as well. Um, so a buyer who's putting 20% down, if that appraisal comes in low, even 20, 30, 40 grand, that person is in a really good position to move forward regardless. And it's a difficult concept for the buyer to wrap their head around but we have to understand the market we're in, right? We're in a market where we're offering 10, 20, 30,000 over ask. We're, we're getting appraisals at that. I had an appraisal come in on a 350 contract at 380. Um, it's happening frequently. So we know these values are somewhat inflated and maybe not really realistic, but that's just where they are. But let's take an easy math scenario. Let's say a $200,000 purchase with 20% down, that's 40 grand down, right? And that house only appraises at 180. Now the buyer doesn't want to spend any more money than they were going to spend before, which was 40 grand plus their closing costs. Okay. If that appraisal comes in at 180, who can tell me what number I can lend off of? Is it the $200,000 contract price or the $180,000 appraised value? Somebody give me an answer on that. I put them to sleep already, Ryan. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry, you woke me up with that question. Um, <laughs> right. uh, the uh, I would I would uh, normally since you're asking it like a trick question, I'm going to say the the 200, but I would normally say the 180. And see, Ryan is always wrong, no matter what, and he's helping. Me <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry, the dog's going crazy. Give me one second. That's what happens when you say I'm wrong. Um, anybody know the end? I don't I don't know the answer to that. I would assume it was the 180, but I'm sure it's the 200. All right. Sorry about that. So it's the $180,000 appraised value. Okay. Um, so that means that if they still have to buy the house at 200 and they do 180 and 20% down, which is 36 plus the extra 20 grand, that's 56,000, right? That's $16,000 more than the buyer wants to spend. So what do we do? We increase the loan to value. So throw out kind of the 20% down because why do, why do people want to put 20% down? I know Ryan knows the answer to that. Save on PMI. They don't want PMI or insurance, correct. 
So when you have, you know, PMI, which isn't the worst thing in the world, right? If somebody only has 5% down and they can still do a loan, that's not terrible. You pay a little bit more monthly. It goes away on conventional loans at some point, but it's better than telling someone, hey, the only option you have is 20% down. So take the next two years to save 30 grand, right? So what we do is we just raise the loan to value. And while we have mortgage insurance, when we're over 20% loan to value, let's say in this case, I have to do 90% loan to value. So they're doing 10% down and they're going to pay their mortgage insurance up front. There are three ways to pay mortgage insurance. It can be monthly. It can be up front, which is called a single pay premium, or it can be a split premium where they pay a percentage up front and a percentage monthly. So all I do is I price out single pay premium mortgage insurance. And let's assume that it costs $5,000 to pay that mortgage insurance up front. It's gone. The, parent, the, the client doesn't have to pay it monthly. They never have to worry about dropping it. They just paid it at closing and it's gone. It's not part of their payment. All I do is manipulate the loan amount to figure out what it's going to take for them to still spend 40 grand plus closing costs out of pocket. And that's how you do that. So there's a lot of really, that's the easiest way when someone has, they're putting down a decent amount of money. It can work for someone anywhere between 10 and 20. It can work for someone putting down five if they have a little bit of extra money and it doesn't come in too low. So that's a really good way to do it. Uh, questions on that or anything else I've kind of touched on at this point. Yeah, Tom, uh, tell us about how quickly you can close a loan nowadays, realistically. We can close loans in 21 to 30 days. Um, I always say three weeks is kind of the minimum for me. Um, the last three or four contracts I've gotten in the, this week, which were at the end of March, all are scheduled to close by the end of April. That's what everybody wants, right? That's the, the again, the, the listing agents are controlling, the, the sellers are controlling the transaction, the time frame. You, you got to kind of do what they want right now. Um, very easy for us to do that because we're a direct lender, uh, which means we underwrite, process, fund a loan at Waterstone. Underwriters are down the hall from me. I can go, go down there and bug them if they're being slow or have questions. We underwrite in 48 hours. Um, if you're working with a direct lender, that's great. If you're working with a broker, it's a lot more difficult to close in that time frame. So just be aware of that. You might have a good lender that's a broker and we have broker options and I have relationships with two lenders that I broker too frequently and I can get those done a little quicker, but most of the time those are 45 days plus. They're just slow. I've got one at Freedom Mortgage right now that's taking, it's been there 10 days, hasn't been under it yet. So be aware of that. Be aware of who your lender is, who they're working with. Um, and what their timeframes are. But, but, you know, most of us that are direct lenders can close in less than 30 days. Okay. Anything else? Any other questions for Tom? You wanted to talk about uh, buying a second home? Yeah, so there's a couple of different ways that you can buy a house. And uh, I forget who was talking about considering new builds as an option. I think it was George. George, I think that's a terrible idea. And that's only because I'm not a preferred lender for every builder. <laughs> um, clearly, the builders have the advantage with that. And, and it's, a great, it's a great tool for you guys. I tell every client I pre-approve, I said, look, if they end up calling me and saying, hey, we're looking at KB Homes or whatever, I'm like, use their lender. If they're giving you a five, seven, $10,000 incentive to use their lender, don't throw that money away. I cannot match that. I could match a thousand dollar credit. I can't match those credits. So just a, for me, and I'll tell that client, look, I may not work with you on this one, but you know, let's work together on the next one, or you can uh, refer your friends to me or whatever, but take advantage of, of what those lenders offer. Um, on a side note, I'll always tell that client that they can send me the quote they have from that lender. If they're charging them some sort of ridiculous costs or fees, I'll let them know that, but most of them don't do that. Um, it, it is a big advantage if your client can buy a home without selling their current home. Okay. Um, they can still buy it as a primary residence. We consider the departing residence. So that's the house they're going to sell. Uh, an investment property, and we count the full expense against them. 
if they truly are going to make it an investment property and rent it out, we can have them get a tenant to come in there. You have to be very specific about that. Uh, they have to have a lease for 12 months and a deposit from that person in order to offset that expense, okay? So that is one thing that we will discuss with that client that look, if you feel like you're gonna rent this property, uh, that client needs to tell me, yes, I want to rent this property uh, and buy a new house, then that's what I'm gonna tell them to do. If their plan changes at closing, I don't have any control over it, okay? If they are qualified and have enough income and have enough funds to put down on the house to get the loan that they want. So let's take an example of someone who's gonna sell a house walk away with 40 grand, they want to put that 40 grand on the next house, but they can't qualify with, uh, uh, they, could, they, they just don't want to try to sell that house because it's tough. You got the contingency, you guys got to be under contract already. Or, you know, what if the deal falls through on the sale of the home? If they have the funds to put down in the bank, well, it's really easy because now if they can qualify with both payments, we just say, okay, we count the expense of the current home. We put our 40% down 20% down out of the bank. And then when we sell our house, we just put our money back in the bank. Really easy, right? Well, what about the client that doesn't have the money in the bank? They only have 5% down, 10% down. They want to take the proceeds from the sale of their home and use it on their new home. They don't want a 95% loan in the end. What we will do is we will do the loan that they want. Let's say they want an 80% loan or they want to have been able to put 20% down, but they can't sell their house and they don't have the funds, okay? So we're gonna do an 80% first mortgage and we're gonna do a 10 or 15% second mortgage on that purchase or an equity line. Everybody's familiar with equity lines or HELOCs and how those work, right? If you have a first mortgage, there are banks today that will give you a second mortgage or an equity line up to a total of 90 to 95% total loan to value. What that client will do is they'll buy the new house, they'll have a first and second mortgage, Six weeks later, they've closed on the sale of their current home. They take that 40 grand, they pay off that equity line, and now they're just left with that first mortgage that they want in the they wanted from the beginning. Okay, so that is is the best way to do it for someone who uh, wants to move quick, buy a house, not sell their house, and still have the flexibility to have the kind of loan they want. The reason we do that, and we don't want them to try to pay down a bigger mortgage if they just did one big loan is because their payment's not going to change. It's not going to be the payment they want in the end. So I can give you more details on that if you want, or if you have questions on that, happy to answer. Tom, I'm going to go back to uh, new construction here real quick because you just talked about it. Can you do a nine-month rate lock? I uh, don't think we can go that far on anything except a construction loan. Okay. But I'd have to check, Dalton. We might be able to do that on new construction. I just haven't done that. That's a really long time. Typically, you don't lock more than 60 days on a loan, except for a construction loan. Got it. But yeah, it, it could be available. I just, again, I haven't checked it. I'd have to look and I'll do that and I'll shoot an email to Ryan and let him know. All right, uh, Tom, a couple more questions from chat. Does Tom contribute anything to buyer purchase? And if yes, yes what? Uh, we can. Um, we always say, let's get the seller to pay closing costs, right? That's always the preferred way to do it. But in this market, they don't want to do that. Or they might still, if they get the right price. It, to be honest with you, if you sell it right, who cares, right? If the seller is getting 300 for their house versus 305 and pay 5,000 in closing costs, what's the difference? It's a couple hundred bucks in, in title fees or, or, or title, you know, it's, it's nothing. But in this market, people don't want to do that. So yes, um, it's actually not just a seller credit. Technically, it's called an interested party contribution. It can come from the seller, me as the lender, or you as the realtor, right? You guys can contribute as well. You can put part of your commission. I've had deals where all three have contributed. We've had a buyer who needed help, and I gave 1%. Realtor gave half a percent. Seller gave 1%. It all worked out. So that's a possibility as well. So the short answer is yes. It does depend on the client, how much. Um, there's a couple of different ways to do that. We only have so much flexibility. There's a cost for every rate, right? Um, we only have so much flexibility and so much we can contribute, but yes, we can do that when we need to up to a certain point. Um, so it just depends on the client and what they need. 
Okay. Um, can they rent the current home if they are getting an FHA loan or is it only conventional? My understanding was the purchasing home must be 100 miles away. Okay. So there's a couple things there. Um, do another FHA loan if you have an FHA loan. So that's, that's where it gets a little tricky if they've currently got an FHA loan. Uh, VA is a little different. Um, VA allows you to keep your property. I had one recently where the veteran owned a home is an investment property in Texas that used to be his primary residence. It's been an investment property for years. He kept a VA loan on it. He was able to do another VA loan, but they may be limited and not be able to do 100% financing. Um, as a formula, we have to calculate depending on how much of their entitlement, it's called an entitlement of how much they've used already on that current loan, but they could potentially keep that property. And it can be, um, maybe they have to put down 2.2% or something like that. It's just a, a formula that we calculate. So it's still a real good option. The distance is only an issue when you're talking about second homes, not primary residences versus investment property. Um, I can buy the house next door as my primary residence and rent this house out uh, because I'm buying a new primary residence and I'm converting my current primary to an investment property. I cannot buy that house as a second home because it's too close. That's where the distance comes in. A second home, most people say vacation home, uh, technically in lending world, it's called a second home. Um, that has to be a certain distance away. It also has to make sense. It can't just necessarily be a certain distance uh, it needs to be on the beach in a resort area. It needs to kind of make sense, right? And the drawback to trying to do something with a second home is that that expense has to count along with the primary residence. So I'm not sure if the question was directed at the scenario I gave where they're trying to convert their current to an investment property. But if it was, there is no distance requirement. Again, it can be right next door, 10 miles away, 100 miles away. It doesn't matter. So if there's a follow-up to that, then please let me know. I have another question. I have a buyer from out of state that's doing a construction, a new construction of Bomb Ghost. Yep. They want to qualify for a three percent. Can you do that on a construction on a construction loan? Three percent down conventional is reserved for first-time home buyers. Um and something I found out the other day, it's amazing, 17 years in this business, you learn something new frequently. Um, they can't have a non-occupant co-borrower like a parent um, and do 3% down um, because that second borrower is not a first-time home buyer, uh, if they're not a first-time home buyer. Um, wasn't aware of that until I ran that through automated underwriting, just never really ran into that scenario. But um, yeah, when conventional went to 3% down, um, they, they make that for first time home buyers. And if technically you can be a first time home buyer multiple times in your life. Does anybody know the waiting period where technically you're a first time home buyer again? There's no waiting period as long as you have sold the house prior to getting the, uh, applying for the uh, first time home buyer. That's, that's how a, I understand it. That's a good guess, but X technically three years. I've owned a property for three years and still be a first time home buyer. Okay, Tom. The requirement. Uh, reading from chat. I have a buyer pre-approved for a conventional with 20% down as a second home. They are looking at a new build. Do they have to go back to the lender and get a construction loan? No. Okay. So the difference between new construction and a construction loan, which is technically, con technically called construction to permanent financing, or you've heard the term construction perm or CP loan, probably. Okay. See some of you shaking your heads, nodding your heads. Um, New construction is KB Homes, Lennar. Those are new construction builder, track builders that are building multiple homes in a neighborhood. Um, a construction loan or CP loan is done through a private builder. You buy a lot and you hire XYZ builders to build your house or that builder acquire the lot for you as part of the construction contract. So there's a difference there. Um, when you're working with a new construction lender, Again, Lennar, KB, et cetera. Um, they have their own in-house lenders. You're doing traditional financing, just like you're buying a resale home. The, really, the only difference is the cost because builders don't pay the doc stamps and the owner's title that a seller normally does in Florida. 
So there's more cost for the buyer, although they are generally getting a very large credit. So it kind of offsets that. Um, with a construction loan, completely different. Again, private builder, uh, build on your own lot. Does that, does that help clarify that? Thanks. I believe so. Um, any other, she said yes, thank you. Any other questions for Tom? Can you explain what is the difference between FHA loans and VA loans in terms of financing requirements? Um, yes. I also heard rumors that, you know, I don't know if this is a true statement, but I heard that, you know, FHA appraisals or VA appraisals tend to be lower than conventional. I don't know what that's true or not. Yeah. I'm so glad you asked that question because I hear that a lot. And I've got a client right now who had a foreclosure um, five or six years ago. He is qualified for an FHA loan. He's reestablished his credit. It's been several years. He's got a good credit score. He's putting 20% down. He has gotten turned down from two or three offers solely because he's doing an FHA loan. Why am I having to do a loan? Because the waiting period for foreclosure is seven years if you want to do another conventional loan. It doesn't matter what kind of loan you had for those events. It matters what kind of loan you're trying to do. So conventional FHA and VA all have different requirements when it comes to if you had a foreclosure, bankruptcy, short sale, how long you have to wait before you can do one of those loans. Some clients are only qualified for one type of loan right now. And there is absolutely no difference in what a conventional FHA, I can't say VA, a conventional or FHA appraiser is going to note as an issue on the property. If the roof leaks, the roof leaks. It doesn't matter what kind of loan the buyer's doing. If there's damage and wood rot and an AC that doesn't work, that appraiser is going to note all of those things regardless of what kind of loan that buyer is doing. But there are a lot of realtors out there who have the misconception that, oh, and it's an FHA loan. That must be a lesser borrower than a conventional borrower. That's not the case. If you actually look at the minimum credit scores, 620 is the minimum for conventional. Um, Hernandez, I, I, I don't know if your first name is Hernandez or not, but um, I beat you to your question. <laughs> Thank you for asking that in the chat. Um, conventional 620 can't go below that no matter what. FHA technically is 640. So it's higher. It's a higher minimum credit score. And often my FHA buyers are more qualified than a conventional buyer. They're only doing FHA because maybe their credit score is around 700 and they're just going to get a better rate and a better PMI rate than on a conventional loan. I'm, see, I'm, I'm jumping everybody. Um, the um, pricing, um, so there are pricing tiers for each type of loan. And if you're 720 and below, an FHA payment will typically be better than a conventional payment at minimum down payments, okay? So the, the main differences are with conventional, you can put 3% down with FHA, three and a half. That 3% is reserved for first-time home buyers. So the default to conventional is 5%. Again, if you're not a first-time home buyer, you can still do an FHA or conventional loan, but you might save one and a half percent by doing FHA and it might give you a better payment. VA appraisers, yes, they can be a little pickier, okay? But it's still big obvious things that they're gonna pick on. It's not little stuff. It's not just because there's a little wood rot on the fascia, one appraiser is gonna be more difficult than the other, okay? Um, th those are the main differences. Does that help answer your question? Yes, thank you. Um, and I, I meant to say on the minimum credit scores, with six conventional, it's definitely capped at six. You can't go below it for any reason. FHA, while it might be 640, I can actually go between 600 and 640. Most of those I have to broker. Rates aren't going to be as good. Um, going to be a little scrutinized a little further, but we can still do that. So I can work with buyers down to a 600 credit score is the bottom line. Um, Pre-COVID, we could actually go down to 500, which probably scares the heck out of all of you. Um, with FHA and VA through a couple of our brokers. But those are not available anymore. And frankly, we'll be happy if that doesn't come back because I closed a 550 VA loan that was a nightmare a year and a half ago. So any other questions in the chat that you see, Ryan? 
Yeah, how long does the client have to wait if they had a uh, bankruptcy because of health reasons? So that's a good question because there's a there's a chart that um, I could actually send you guys that shows the waiting period for each of the loan types. Um, FHA, VA are shorter than others. Um, conventional, again, seven years is the longest for a foreclosure. However, if you filed bankruptcy and included a foreclosure, so let's say you, you just had trouble, put your house into bankruptcy, the bankruptcy got discharged, but it took until last year for the foreclosure to happen because that's literally what happens. Banks take so long to foreclose, they get dragged out so long that people are stuck. If you had to go by the strict seven years, that person would be waiting forever to do a, a conventional loan. However, if you included a property in the bankruptcy, you only have to wait the bankruptcy period. So that's just a little side note. But each of them are different. Um, I'll send Ryan a, an email he can forward to you guys that has a, a chart that shows the waiting periods. Um, it's, it's again, four years bankruptcy for conventional. It's two or three for FHA and VA. Um, USDA is similar to the, they're all government loans, USDA. I haven't really touched on that one because we don't use it near as much. A little harder to qualify. It's technically a conventional loan, so. But the bankruptcy doesn't matter if it was medical? I'm sorry, that does, thank you for reminding me of that. There are exceptions. It's a really, really, really short list of exceptions. Um, and that's included, it probably will be included in what I'm sending you. Um, it basically has to be the death of a wage earner or spouse or a serious medical issue that kept somebody out of work for a long time for them to grant an exception and shorten those wait periods. They can be shortened down to a year in some cases if that happened, but it's it's gotta be documented. It's gotta be something pretty extreme. It can't just be, oh, I was having trouble making my payments. You know, it, it's, it's, it's difficult. I've only, a divorce doesn't count. Um, people ask me that a lot. Uh, I've only actually been able to use that one time because someone's spouse passed away and they were the primary wager. Um, gambling problems? No, Ryan, you have to stop betting on the pony. <laughs> All right. Um, and, uh, our, our March Madness, which back. your bracket looks like mine. It's pretty horrible. I didn't even bother with one. Are piggyback loans back? If yes, do you offer them? So that's um, what I was talking about before. If someone um, wants to buy a home without selling theirs and can qualify, but they want to be able to use the proceeds, that's what I was explaining is we'll use a first mortgage and backed by a second mortgage at the same time. It's called a simultaneous purchase. If some of you that have been around a while, been around a while may remember the term 80-20. We used to do 80% first mortgages and 20% second mortgages for 100% financing because people didn't want PMI. It was a good way to avoid PMI. Um, frankly, you can look at that in a couple of different ways. I think that um, sometimes PMI is not so bad um, and we can't go to 100% financing anymore anyway. Uh, most second lenders and banks will only go to 90% combined. I have one that goes to 95, and there are some credit unions that go to 95, but they've gotta be well-qualified buyers. So technically that's what people refer to as a piggyback loan. We also use that when someone's buying over around 600 to 650, because the conventional loan limit is 548,250. So if you're buying a $700,000 house and you don't wanna put 150,000 down to get to that 548 conventional loan limit. And you'll have PMI because you won't be at 80% loan to value. We'll do a first mortgage somewhere at or under that number. And then we'll do a second mortgage so the borrower can only put down 10% or potentially 5%. I have a client right now that's buying a seven, $715,000 property buying uh, with 5% down with a conventional first mortgage and an equity line to bridge the gap. And, and that's, that's how that would work. Okay, uh, Tom, tell us how you collaborate with realtors. Um, okay, that's kind of a wide open question. Um, yeah, Joy, maybe Joy, you can be more specific on how he collaborates with realtors. <laughs> I just wanted to know how I want to know how you work with realtors in terms of, um, you know, do you help out apart, you know, apart from the mortgage aspect, how do you help realtors out? 
Yeah, that is a good question. And, and the way I collaborate is awesomely is the short answer. But um, I think the best thing a lender can do for you as a realtor is tell you that your, qual your clients are qualified when they are and tell you that they're not qualified when they're not. We don't want to waste your time. You don't want to waste your time. Your job is to get out there and get clients to either house or buy a house. Okay. So as a lender, the primary role for us is to make sure that I'm not wasting your time. I do that by being honest with you and the client and making sure that they are qualified, that I gather documents if they're self-employed. I'm not pre-approving them without reviewing tax returns and calculating income. If there's anything I'm concerned about, you know, a client that calls me and says, I've, I've been a VP of sales for 20 years. I make $200,000 a year. I've got $300,000 in the bank. This is the fifth home I've bought. His credit score is a 780. I'm not a buyer. I'm going to gather the minimum documents, pull credit, run them through an automated underwriting system and tell you they're approved. Anybody who's got anything a bit tricky, I'm going to spend more time making sure they're qualified. And then I'm going to let you know so you don't waste your time driving them around. I've had plenty of realtors call me and say, hey, I just drove this person around for three days and, uh, oh, can you get them pre-approved? Sure, I pull credit, it's a 590. Can't do anything. So don't put yourself in that situation. So I think that's the best thing we can do. The next best thing we can do is throughout the loan process, while we're working on your client's loan after you're under contract, is to make sure you know what's going on with that loan. So you don't have to call me. How many of you call your lenders twice a week and ask them, where are we? What's going on? How are we doing? Is the appraisal back yet? Hey, did you get that appraisal back yet? It's okay to do that. I get that, you know, this is your livelihood and all that. But what we should do as lenders is inform you once a week or more what's going on with the loan. So that's what we try to do is make sure you're informed as much as possible so you don't have to spend your time worrying about it. We let you know we got it. It's in process. I'm gonna let you know as soon as that appraisal comes in, Within an hour or two of that appraisal coming in, if I don't see it, my assistant Chris calls me and says, the Jones appraisal came in, I'm calling both agents and letting them know, okay? Um, as far as helping you with marketing and those sorts of things, that's kind of a one-off conversation. I'll be honest with you, I've tried different things over the years. It doesn't benefit lenders enough to generally do that. And I know that's not really the answer that you guys wanna hear, but it's it's true, The the old, the old school ways of you guys learning from Ryan and Clarissa and everybody else that's your leadership there to do the things you need to do to find clients and be successful are still the proven methods. And all the little different things that we've tried, they don't bring good borrowers. That's the bottom line is I've tried Zillow leads. I've tried so many different things. I'll get a hundred leads and I might maybe get one that's qualified. It's just it's not a good payoff. Now, if you've got an idea you wanna talk about, um, I've sponsored your happy hours. I'll do different things with you guys. If you wanna do open houses and you want me to come to the open house, um, I can print flyers for um, your listing that show payment options. So somebody can walk out of the house knowing, hey, if I put X down, this is what my payment's gonna look like. I'm happy to do that for any of you, anytime. You email me the listing, you send me a headshot, I will get you a flyer. Um, so those are the, those are the best ways I think that I can help you. Uh, and again, if you have any, uh, ideas, I'm certainly at least happy to discuss them with you. Thank you. You're welcome. I saw a couple of questions. Um, Hernandez has a question about, can a, can a realtor represent the buyer and also do the loan if they're a licensed loan officer? I'm not sure I understand that question. Um, if you're, uh, we have a lot of, uh, uh, my, uh, Hernandez, my answer is I don't think they can because I've had some of you guys are uh, licensed loan officers and they always have somebody else do the deal for them. So I don't know that they can do that. Um, a realtor and a loan officer be the same person on a deal. We are, we are technically supposed to be licensed real estate agents if we're full-time lenders. Um, we can be. It's very rare, um, but again, I, I honestly, I got my real estate license before I got into the mortgage business because I wasn't sure which way I wanted to go in 2003, but um, I, I let it lapse. Um, uh, I think it's difficult to do both. 
I don't know that um, that's very common. I think you can do it. Um, I think it's diff it's it's difficult. I know it seems kind of funny to be doing that, but it, it's as far as I know, yes, legally you can have both licenses. Um, there's also different types of licenses for mortgage lenders. I don't have to get I don't have to go through class and get a specific mortgage license because I work for um, a company that has an overall license that under. Um, most direct lenders are like that. Most brokers are not. So probably depends on the type of lender that they are, but it is allowed. It's just not very common and it's, it's kind of frowned upon in our industry. It was allowed back in, uh, before the recession, back in 2005, 2004, uh, yeah. it was allowed that they could do both. So I was just Absolutely. wondering if you can still do that. Yeah, it was, it was done a lot back then. Right. And, um, a lot of things are different, but but yes, that was very common. I, I remember seeing signs in buildings all the time that said, you know, realtor, lender, car wash, taxes, <laughs> 15 you know, things uh, in one building, you know. Tom, I think I think that uh, it is, I think most mortgage companies have a rule against it. I think is the yeah. is what it is. Um, yeah. Because I have I have agents sometimes who have gone into uh, mortgages. And the company has told them they can't even have an active real estate license. Yeah. And then I've got, I have some agents who are both. And a lot of times they'll have somebody, a, a friend of theirs, another agent, put their name on as the agent. So I don't yeah. know what they're doing. Um, but I think it's, I think it's company specific, mortgage company specific. It, it is. And again, we, we hire, we've hired people that have been realtors. Um, and most of them, we ask them to let their license lapse. But look, my philosophy is be really good at one thing, I mean, hobbies and do other things, but it's, it's a difficult balance. You know, your job's hard enough as it is as a realtor and, and mine's not easy sometimes as a lender either. So I think if you're really good at that one thing, you should just do that one thing and collaborate with or work with somebody that you like. I love working with the agents I work with and we've, I've got some I've worked with for years. You guys if you have a great lender that you love working with and they do a great job for you and you don't have to worry about it, you just give them clients and let it go. That's the best thing you can find. Uh, if you don't have anybody, happy to work with you. But if you've got somebody good, man, stick with them. You know, and too many times that uh, people work with somebody that doesn't do a good job and they don't go find a better option. Yeah, right. Um, do you work with government programs? Yes. Maybe you're talking about like down payment assistance. Yes. Multiple options for that. Um, Orange County housing finance, Florida bond. Um, yes. Is the short answer. Fantastic. Uh, Tom, we brought you on here for one purpose and it's been a, just an all out mortgage festival in here. We brought you in nice. to talk about how, uh, how we could win some of these uh, multiple offer situations, but it's become uh, Mortgage 101, which is great. A lot of people have a lot of questions and it's good to get all this stuff cleared up. So I appreciate you coming in and hanging in there. Yeah, happy um, to help. How fast can you close a down payment assisted deal? Um, not 21 days. <laughs> Those are going to take longer. We have to work with, you know, it's, it's like anything. If I'm working with a first and second mortgage in the scenarios I explained earlier, um, we definitely would like to see 45 to 60 days on those just to be safe. Um, and again, that's a, that's a great conversation to have when we pre-approve somebody. Um, manufactured homes, I didn't talk about, but that's another one where I will tell the realtor, hey, my client wants to buy this. You know that. This is the only thing they want to buy. This is what they're qualified for. Please do not write me a contract for less than 45 days. Even if it's in-house, I do some in-house, I broker some. There's extra steps. So anything outside of the, the norm, just a straightforward, I'm doing a regular FHA conventional VA loan, Anything outside of that, try to do 45 days. It's just, everyone's going to be happy. Very well. Um, it looks like, uh, any other questions for Tom? He's just a wealth of knowledge. We just need his uh, contact information, please. I put it in, I put in the chat earlier. Um, if you scroll up in the chat, you'll see it up there. Somebody asked for it earlier. Yeah. And I, as I mentioned, I'll send Ryan um, a couple of those uh, information things. There'll, there'll be flyers that he can forward to you guys that they have all my contact info on there. Okay. Tom, if you don't mind, just write in the chat, write your email and everything and your, your name and 
your phone number. Sure, I'll, I'll give you guys my website. It's just my name. It's tomwinder.com and everything's right there. Okay. Um, Clients to do an application. All right. So uh, any other questions for Tom? Hi, Tom. Um, I have one question for you. What do you think about redlining? Does it still exist? I sure hope not. I'd like to believe that it doesn't, um, but um, it, it, it might. Um, I don't see any evidence of it personally, but, um, you know, I think right now it's just a weird time. So it's kind of hard to figure out, you know, sellers are making decisions based on so many different factors, realizing that, you know, they hold all the cards, but, um, you know, we, we don't participate in, in anything like that. And there's, there's some, uh, they've updated our applications to include a lot more information so they can actually follow up on that. They've expanded the demographic questions and post-closing loans are um, uh, scrutinized and looked at to make sure, you know, hey, is Tom given the same rate to people who are, who are Hispanic or not Hispanic or, um, anything else. So uh, that's all followed up and, and watched much more closely since the CFPB, CBC, uh, our, our governing body has been in place. In Toronto, we can close in 10 days. That's amazing. Who can do that? I have no idea how things work in Canada. That's a, that's a whole, like a whole different country up there. It's, it's just like one. Um, I don't, I, I, Sure, there's different regulations and different process. I don't know. Yeah, I would think so. Look, can I close one in 10 days or so? We've done it, absolutely. And really the only way to do that is, um, and it's the appraisal that holds us up. Now I will tell you that a very, very, very small percentage of purchase deals are getting appraisal waivers now. I've had two in the last month where we run the loan through an automated underwriting system and it just accepts the value and says, yep, we're good. And I don't have to order an appraisal. Those things can happen faster. It happens fairly frequently on refis. Uh, still doing a lot of refis. A lot of people sitting on four plus percent rates and we're still getting them in the threes, potentially high twos on shorter term loans. But the short answer is it ha everything has to go perfectly and I have to have everything in hand from day one. So um, if I have to order an appraisal, I need the borrower's documents day one, every document. Um, we need to order rushes on everything. Um, and there's still no guarantee that's going to happen. The time it happens the most is when we're rescuing a deal. Somebody calls us and says, hey, my deal fell apart at XYZ Bank because um, they said they could do it and then they couldn't. And they told us and we're closing in three days. Okay, well, we're not going to close in three days, but we can close it in seven to 10 days if I can transfer the appraisal. The only time I can do that is on a conventional loan. I'm sorry, FHA loan. I can transfer the appraisal over. Um, if I don't have to order a new one and the borrower literally sends me every document I need on day one, then yeah, I could close in that short of time. All right. Um, any other, any other questions for Tom? All right, guys. Well, thank you, Tom. I appreciate you coming in. Um, thank you. See you soon. Thanks everybody. Yeah. Um, appreciate it. All right, guys. Any other questions? Um, for me or anything else, uh, FRI questions, anything like that. Abby's here as well. If you have any marketing stuff for Abby. Um, I have a general question um, yes. for people that are doing new construction. So this isn't, I mean, it's not really an issue. I just don't like it. I don't feel comfortable. When I go to new construction, they're, I mean, obviously they have a billion people trying to buy. So they're requiring 10, maybe even 20% into escrow for six, seven, eight months. I personally wouldn't be com feel comfortable doing that because I could use that same money and I could go make money on it. Um, so I don't feel comfortable giving that, giving up that much money. Now I have, I'm working with clients who are putting that much money down. So they have the cash, but what are you guys doing with, if you have an FHA or a VA buyer who doesn't have that kind of cash to put 10% down on a $350,000 new construction? Is anybody else having that problem is, are you getting that waived? Anybody? Anybody had any success getting it waived, getting the 10, 10 15, 20% down at a new construction waived? 
Yeah, with Lennar, our VA buyer, they only asked for $2,000 at first and then another $2,000 like within a couple months. So it ended up being a lot less than 10% that they were asking for. But that was like a month ago. And I really feel like every month things are changing to be month. more. That's the only, only people I've had success with was Lennar. I have a 443 pending and they wanted $44,000 in the escrow. So I got them to drop that to five. So we had to put like 22 or whatever it was, but that's as low as I could get them. They said, if we went any lower, then they'll just move on to the next contract. Yeah, I think I would be happy with the 5% because yeah, that's that's definitely a lot less than what they've been saying. And but that was I a VA buyer be. too. So he has no down payment. It's crazy, yeah. So. Yeah, so, um, well, I guess they could be negotiated a little bit then with some of them, so there's something. Um, yeah, next month they'll cut you out of the deal, Angie. They'll just keep changing, to the, changes, changing stuff and changing stuff. Yeah, um, mm -hmm. yep, every day. All right, so um, guys, remember this stuff, who's doing what to you when, when the market turns around and they're begging you, you know? Um, all right, um, any other questions? Hey, Ryan, yeah, I have a question on the new build. Yeah. So um, I have this client, we're trying to finalize on a, on a contract for a new build in Oviedo. Um, so this is a small builder. I have like nine homes in this community. And uh, when I'm speaking with them, he's asking me to send them a contract like as is, um, you know, to do the, the regular contract on my end. And then they're going to send me an addendum on the builder side. So how do I structure the uh, contract on this particular, since it's a new build? I mean, would I put an appraisal, inspection, whatever, all those things? It's going to be like 5% at, at closing. Uh, just, just write it like you would, like you were buying a house. Um, cool. We're not going to, so when you also, when you put it in our system, guys, um, put, it, put that in as a uh, regular purchase um, okay. with that same checklist. We'll waive the seller's property disclosure. We'll waive all the stuff that doesn't apply um, uh -huh. on your checklist. So, uh, when you're doing it, just like you're buying it. So you agreed to, to buy it for 450, you know, write the contract right. for 450, uh, leave the inspection, leave all that stuff. Their addendum is going to override everything that you do anyway, but just make it oh. like it's a normal contract where you're buying a normal house for 450. Okay. Okay. Yeah, this is don't put any of, appraisal of, or inspection contingency, any of them? Um, yeah, just, I, I would leave the inspection. I would leave that blank where it's at 15 days. They're going to write an addendum that's going to make sure that you inspect it before you buy it, obviously. Right. Um, you're going to still have your walkthrough. You're still going to have all of that. It still has to appraise. They're still going to have an appraisal come out. Your lender is right. still going to have an appraiser come out. Okay. Um, and obviously, it'll be a very easy appraisal if they've sold a bunch of them already in there, or if yeah, six of them already mm -hmm. of the same type okay. of house. They're going to be easy appraisal. So yeah, just write it like normal. Now their addendum have. I just went through this with somebody else. Have your have their attorney, or at least instruct them to have an attorney review this addendum from the builder. This is not a yes. bar form. This is not something we're licensed to to be attorney yeah. on. So if it I was thinking already, of that already. Yeah. Okay. Well, if it's not already approved language, which which a builder's addendum is not going to be, it's written by their attorney. So your buyer at least instruct them to have an attorney do it. They may just look at it and say that's ah, fine, but okay. at least instruct them in writing that you recommend oh. the attorney look at it because you are not an attorney. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you for that. Okay. All right. So, but their addendum is going to override all your inspection period and, and all that stuff, but you are going to need an appraisal. Hey, Ryan, on the listed yes. agreement, you said to do it as, as is. Uh, if that's what her, that's what the builder wanted. She said, she said, that's what the builder wanted. Yeah, that, that's what he wanted. Which is fine. Yeah, there's, there's yeah. no problem. That, uh, again, this addendum that they put on there, it's not going to be a three line addendum. It's going to be a, a eight page addendum. I'm sure I yeah. am. Okay. Thank you. I mean, eight, 18 or six or something. It's going to be a big addendum. It's going to rewrite most of the contract. Yes. Any other questions? Oh, quick question, Ryan. Uh, on a uh, For sale by owner, if you have a contract, I send the full contract, the uh, FHA and HOA. Do you still need the service disclosure as part of the contract? Okay. Um, a seller's disclosure is not a legally required document. It's required by your brokerage. It protects you is what it does. Okay. 
They can't say that your seller didn't tell them something was wrong with the house and they can't say that the communication stopped with you. It protects you, which is why your brokerage likes it. It's why you like it. Um, a seller doesn't have to sign that. You do still have to disclose. It's best to go ahead and do it in writing and have a thorough disclosure of everything that you know. Um, so I would still present that to the seller of the FISBO and have them fill it out. How about if he, how about if it wasn't signed? Do, do I still have a contract, a full, uh, full contract without that disclosure? Oh, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, oh. the seller's disclosure is not part of the contract. Got it, okay. I will give you a call later on another question. Okay. Thank you. Ryan, if you have a if you have a contract listed as is, and buyer comes in and finds that it needs a new roof, but they bought the they bought the house as is, is the seller obligated? Give me that again. So that the the buyer bought a house as is and it needs a new roof. Right. You discovered that during inspection. Yes. Um, the buyer can either get out during inspection or they can ask the seller to contribute to a new roof or replace the roof. And at that point, it's up to them to decide based on the seller's response what they want to do. Okay. So if I, if I buy a house and it needs a new roof like today or, you know, whatever, uh, soon it's leaking already, whatever, I'm going to ask for, uh, you know, depending on what the market is right now, it's a little harder in the seller's market, but I'm going to ask for some sort of contribution toward a new roof. Uh, the seller is well aware that their roof is 20 years old and starting to fall apart. Okay. okay. Seller can say no, in which case the buyer can back out or say, you know, we're going to just make it work. But if you're on the selling side of that, if you're on the listing side and that happens, you got to talk to your clients and say, look, we can, we can get rid of this guy but our next buyer is going to say the same thing. And now we know we got a bad roof and we have to disclose it. Okay. Any other questions? All right, guys. Um, thank you all for coming. Hopefully you guys all learned something. Everybody uh, had a great time and uh, please let me know if you guys need anything I'm available and Abby's available for any of your marketing needs and uh, We'll be around. See you guys next week. Enjoy your uh, your weekend and your Easter and all that stuff. Thank Bye you, guys. Ryan. Happy Easter, everybody. Happy Easter. Yeah.